This is what she says about the condition of the church in the last days prior to the second coming of Jesus. Some I saw did not participate in this work of agonizing and pleading. Of course, she's referring to a great shaking that she saw that would occur among God's people, the church in the last days. She says that she saw that some of them were not participating in the prayerful agonizing and, of course, uh, seeking after Jesus on a daily basis. So she goes on to say, they, speaking of those who are in the church, but again, are not seeking after and pleading for the Holy Spirit to work in them. She says they seemed indifferent and careless. They were not resisting the darkness around them, and it shut them in like a thick cloud. The angels of God left these. And she, of course, this is a vision she saw. So she says, and I saw them, uh, she said, the angel of God left these, and I saw them hastening to the assistance of those who were struggling with all their energies to resist the evil angels and trying to help themselves by calling upon God with perseverance. But the angels left those who made no effort to help themselves, and I lost sight of them. In this vision she received, which she recorded in the first volume of the Testimonies, she makes it very clear that she saw them. They were indifferent and careless. That's Laodicean. That's exactly what Paul was talking about, the great falling away. People who believe they're married to Jesus, but they're not. They believe they've accepted the truth and living by the truth, but they're not. This is the condition. And of course, it sets us up for a great coming famine. And we're going to see about what this famine is in just a moment. I want to read another quote here. This is from Early Writings, page 54 and 56. Of course, this is uh, in reference to another vision that she had received about the heavenly throne room of God. Jesus and the Father sitting on the throne, and then they get up, they leave the holy place and go into the most holy place. But notice what she says she saw here. She says, before the throne, I saw the Advent people, the church and the world. I saw two companies. One bowed down before the throne, deeply interested, while the other stood, notice the words, uninterested, and careless. Then I saw an exceeding bright light come from the, from the Father to the Son, and from the Son it waved over the people before the throne. But few would receive this great light. Many came out from under it and immediately resisted it. Others were careless and did not cherish the light, and it moved off from them. Then Jesus rose up from the throne, and the most of those who were bowed down arose with him. I did not see one ray of light pass from Jesus to the careless multitude after he rose. And they were left in perfect darkness. And I have to ask a question. How does the, ch how does the church get to that condition? Now, I want to clarify something. When I say the church, of course, we're not talking about everyone in the church, right? The church is a body. And there just happens to be wheat and tares in that body. But of course, how do people in the church come to this condition? How do they arrive at this condition? Of course, there's multiple texts and multiple passages that I could reference uh, about this. But there's one particular text that comes to mind when answering that question. How in the world do people reach this state of apostasy? This state of defecting from truth, divorcing themselves from Jesus, in which they will be caught up in this great famine that is coming. Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus gives us the solution. But notice what the solution includes. It says that he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So how does a person, anyone in the church, arrive to this careless, indifferent, complacent condition of Laodicea? Lukewarmness. How does it happen? Well, it happens because people abandon their daily, genuine Christian walk with Christ. They abandon their daily looking unto Christ and having a genuine spirit-filled experience with Him. Notice how I keep saying daily, because what did Christ say? Let him deny himself and take up his cross, how often? Daily. 
You see, you got a lot of people, my friends, a lot of Christians, professed Christians in the church who are not having that daily communion experience with Christ. They profess Him, as Jesus says, they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Many of us find ourselves in that condition. Some of us can't see it because we're deceived. Deceived into believing that we know Jesus when we do not. Deceived into believing that we're going to go to heaven when in, when in reality, if we don't shape up, examine ourselves and allow Jesus to cleanse us from the inside out, we won't be seeing the kingdom of God, as Jesus said. Paul wrote of this daily experience, this great righteousness by faith experience. He referred to it using the words from faith to faith, day by day, glory to glory. You see, the righteousness by faith experience is a daily ongoing experience with Jesus. And the condition of Laodicea exists, this falling away apostasy experience exists for many because they are not having a genuine step-by-step, day-by-day, faith-to-faith, glory-to-glory moment with Jesus. You see, what Paul is describing in his letters when he writes about this righteousness-by-faith experience and, and, and coming to know Christ and, 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 and Him washing you and cleansing you daily from your sins, you see, that is a process. We know it's a lifelong process of sanctification, but it's a never-ending, ongoing process. And some people, well, truth is, they have hit the pause button on their righteousness-by-faith journey. We reach a point that for whatever reason, we become distracted, we become complacent, we become comfortable in our peace and safety environment, and we stop seeking and looking and searching for the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You see... Many of us hear this language, righteousness by faith, righteousness by faith experience, and sometimes we really can't fully grasp what is that? What, is it, what does that mean? And Ryan, what do you mean by people have pressed the pause button on their righteousness by faith experience? Well, I'm going to take you to Matthew chapter 5 here. I want to spell this out for you very clearly. Probably in no other passage of Scripture is it more clear, uh, clearly mapped out, I guess you could say. As it, did Christ make it more clear uh, other than Matthew chapter 5 here in, the, in the, uh, what we call the Beatitudes? Now, many people read the Beatitudes and they see them as these kind of individual bullet point, you know, just kind of like, you know, blessed is this kind of person and blessed is this kind of person and, oh, these kind of people will be blessed. But really what Christ is doing in the Beatitudes is he's mapping out, he's showing you a step-by-step, you know, one level of Christian character development to the next kind of experience uh, that we call righteousness by faith. So why don't we go there, Matthew chapter 5. I want to show you this very clearly in the Bible. We're going to read through these Beatitudes, and I'm going to show you how they're all interconnected. Jesus is spelling out. He's, he's illustrating out. He's, he's clearly putting it on display as to what this righteousness by faith experience must be if you're going to make sure that you're not caught up in the great falling away and find yourself in trouble during the coming famine the coming famine. Matthew chapter 5, we're going to start reading in verse 3. Notice what the Bible says. Of course, Jesus is speaking, and He gives us that first great beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And you can go through and read these. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are... And so again, we almost look at it almost in a poetic sense. Like Jesus is just like, ah, blessed are these kind of people. Or... Blessed are those kind of people over there. Oh, these kind of people will be blessed. But my friends, notice Jesus is actually taking us through the righteousness by faith experience. So somebody has pressed the pause button along this journey. You don't want to press that pause button. You want to make sure that you continue on this journey because Jesus wants you to have a genuine experience with him. So what does Jesus say right off the cuff? Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Interesting. What does Jesus mean by this? What does he mean, blessed are the poor in spirit? Again, when the Pharisees heard this, you could just imagine their, their mouths flew open, you know, and <gasps> what, what, what did he just say? Whoa, you know, <laughs> because all they probably heard was blessed are the poor. 
Because back in their day, if you were poor and you weren't rich, you were cursed, right? You were cursed by God. If you were rich and you were a, an abundance of worldly goods, well, then you must be blessed by God because he's given you all these wonderful things and he's prospered you. And so I'm sure probably the Pharisees off to the side, they're hearing Jesus, you know, say these words and they're just, oh, what? He just said, blessed are the poor. But that's not what he said. He didn't say blessed are the poor. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit. What in the world does that mean? You see, Jesus is giving us the very first step that we must experience in order to have a genuine experience with Him. When He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, what He's saying is, blessed are you when you realize your spiritual poverty. Blessed are you when you come to the point in your life where you realize you have hit rock bottom and there's nothing else for you to give. Blessed are you when you come to the realization that you see your condition and you recognize that you are spiritually bankrupt and that only Jesus Christ, the Savior, can get you out. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But then notice the next beatitude. He says in verse 4, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Interesting. So blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. So people who are mourning, you know, they're blessed, right? Well, some people would probably disagree with that. Well, when they're mourning, they probably don't feel very blessed. But it's in connection to the previous beatitude. You see, the natural response when you realize, once you realize your spiritual depravity, you will mourn, but yet you'll be comforted. You see, when you realize that your sins nailed Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to a cross, that because of your sins, He had to die. When, that, when you really comprehend that and that settles into your mind, it brings about a natural response. In fact, it's talked about in Zechariah chapter 12, I believe it is, where he makes it very, very clear that they will look upon me whom they have pierced and they will mourn. That's the natural response. Jesus, you died for me. I deserved that death. I deserve to die on a cross. Not you. You're perfect. You're wonderful. You've never sinned. You don't deserve my punishment. But Jesus did it out of love. And when you comprehend that, you will mourn. But yet, you'll be comforted. Notice the next beatitude. Verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Hmm. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You see, this is in connection to the previous two. You see, after you're broken by the love of Jesus, you adopt an attitude of meekness. That's right. Which brings us to our next beatitude. Blessed are those who do hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Notice how this is Jesus taking you from one level of Christian character development to the next. So before you became meek because you were broken by the love of Jesus and you adopted an attitude of meekness. So when you adopt an attitude of meekness, true genuine Christ-like meekness, you begin to hunger and thirst for His righteousness. That's powerful. Jesus is taking it. He's mapping it out. And then, of course, verse 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. You see, there's a difference between human mercy and godly mercy. You see, once you accept the righteousness of Christ in your life, you become merciful. That's just the natural response. Jesus is shaping and molding you into the person that He wants you to be, that vessel of honor for His kingdom. 
So when you hunger and thirst for righteousness, you begin to receive His righteousness on your behalf. And when you accept the righteousness of Christ in your life, you become merciful. But it's not just any old kind of mercy. We're going to see what that is in just a moment. Let's go to the next beatitude because it's in connection. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Pure in heart. So how does that connect to the previous one? Very simple. Once you are merciful, true godly mercy, once you are merciful, and here it is, true godly mercy, and begin to treat others the way God treats us, then and only then, you become pure in heart. Now, will you ever feel that way? I don't think any of us are going to, you know, wake up one day and be like, oh man, I just... I just feel so pure in heart today. I just feel so perfect. None of us are going to feel that way. Because when you look at Christ's righteousness and you see your own, you kind of have that Isaiah experience. Woe is me, right? For I am undone. I am a sinful man. Oh, woe is me, right? I'm the chief of sinners. That's how, that's how Paul uh, made it out. He said, I feel like the chief of sinners. But yet God sees you. He sees that when you begin to show true godly mercy, you begin to treat others the way He treats us, then through His eyes, you are pure in heart. <sighs> but it doesn't stop there. Notice verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Now what in the world does that have to do with the previous Beatitudes? Again, we're on a journey. Christ is changing us. So here it is. Once you are pure in heart, you begin to live and share the message of the Prince of Peace. Christ is taking you on a journey from one level of Christian character development to the next. You're pure in heart. You've received the peace of God in your life. You have accepted the Prince of Peace's righteousness. And so now you begin to live out and share that message of peace, the message of Jesus with others. You don't do it because you're prompted to. You don't do it because you tell yourself, well, I'm, I'm a Christian and that's what I'm supposed to do. You see, it's a natural response. It's kind of like when someone burns their finger or burns their hand in a hot fire. They don't leave it there and go, oh, that burns. That's hot. There's a natural response to pull back into, because you've been hurt. I know that's probably not the greatest illustration, <laughs> but nonetheless, in a, in a positive sense, when you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, a true, genuine, daily experience with Christ, the natural response of living out and declaring the message of the Prince of Peace is that you just got to do it. It's a part of your life. It's a, it's a lifestyle now. Because God has bestowed His love upon you, you can't help to tell people about it and about Him. Which leads us to the last beatitude of this section. Verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Wait, wait, wait a second, Jesus. <laughs> you're supposed to end on a good note. <laughs> you're, supposed to, you're supposed to end with something positive, Jesus. See, we, we're kind of in that mind frame where everything is kind of, kind of, kind of lead to this big happy ending. And, and in reality, this is a happy ending, but the words don't necessarily resonate well with us. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Jesus, you're telling me that, that I'm going to be persecuted? What? That's what you're leading me to? Well, it's not in God's plan for you to be persecuted. But nonetheless, there's an enemy. And as long as that enemy exists, the kingdom agenda of God flies in the face of the dark agenda of the enemy. 
You see, once you are living, genuinely living and sharing the message of the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, you will receive persecution. Not you might, you know, not that you could, you will. That's why Jesus says, you shall, those who, those who receive him shall be persecuted for his name's sake. Now, some of us, we don't really know what it means to be persecuted. And many of us, of all of that that we just read through, Again, let me read through these really quickly here so you get it. You see, blessed are you when you realize your spiritual poverty. It starts there. And then once you realize your spiritual depravity, that you're bankrupt, you see, you're going to mourn because you recognize that Jesus has bestowed his love upon you. He wants to change you. He has taken your penalty. And therefore, you'll mourn, but he's going to come, sweep you up, and he's going to comfort you. After being broken by the love of God, you adopt an attitude of meekness. And of course, when you adopt an attitude of meekness, you hunger and thirst for righteousness. The next one, once you accept the righteousness of Christ in your life, you become merciful, true godly mercy. And of course, once you are merciful and begin to, uh, to treat others the way God treats us, then you become pure in heart. And then once you are pure in heart, you begin to live and share the message of the Prince of Peace. And then, of course, once you are living and sharing the message of the Prince of Peace, you will receive persecution. Why doesn't it seem like there's more persecution in the church today? That's an interesting thought. Now, you may be watching and saying, well, Ron, I'm persecuted all the time. Only you and God truly know if that's the case. But it just doesn't seem like there's much persecution today. I want to read you a quote from Great Controversy, page 48. Listen to this quote. So she asks a question. She says, why is it then that persecution seems in a great degree to slumber? She says, the only reason is that the church has conformed to the world's standard and therefore awakens no opposition. The religion which is current in our day is not, the pure and not of the pure and holy character that marked the Christian faith in the days of Christ and his apostles. It is only because of the spirit of compromise with sin, because the great truths of the word of God are so indifferently regarded, because there is so little vital godliness in the church that Christianity is apparently so popular with the world. Let there be, she says, notice, let there be a revival of the faith and power of the early church and the spirit of persecution will be revived and the fires of persecution will be rekindled. Mm. Why is there no persecution? Because we have people that are not living out and declaring the message of the Prince of Peace. We have people that have pressed the pause button somewhere along that journey. Perhaps maybe they've accepted Jesus. Maybe they've had that mournful experience. But somewhere along the way they failed to become meek. They failed to become humble. They failed to become merciful. Perhaps they're not hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Again, that daily righteousness by faith experience, my friends. You see, Acts chapter 1 verse 8 gives us some insight of what the natural response is of a person who is genuinely led by the Holy Spirit of God. If you are genuinely led by the Holy Spirit of God, there's a natural response. There's an automatic response. Notice what it says, Acts chapter 1 verse 8. I'm going to read a portion of it, and here's what it says. And then, of course, this, this message comes from Jesus. He says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me. You see, when the Holy Spirit has come upon us, my friends, we, we want, we desire, we need to become a witness for Christ because you're being led by the true, genuine Spirit of God. But many of us, my friends, have mercy. We're quenching the Holy Spirit. We 
We're no longer listening to the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. We're going our own way. All we like sheep have gone astray. The work cannot be finished. And we cannot go home until the church wakes up. But there's a famine coming. And because of the current condition, many of us are not ready for the famine. Have you heard the story about the four people named everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody? Let me tell you that story. There was an important job to be done, and everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but nobody did it. Somebody got angry about this because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought anybody could do it, but nobody realized that everybody wouldn't do it. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have done. That right there sums up the condition for most Christians today. We need the fire of the Holy Spirit in our lives to not only just wake us up, but to give us the power to declare the truth of God's Word, to live it out among the world so that we can prepare for the coming famine. Now, I've talked about a famine. <laughs> you see, what we need in our, in our time, what we need today is more Josephs. Did Joseph experience a famine in his day? Now, I told you there's a famine coming, and I believe that there is. And I'm going to tell you about that famine right now in our closing minutes. Everything we've been talking about leads up to this and is connected to this. If you think 2020 was bad, my friends, if we're not rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ, I don't know that we're prepared for what is coming. You see, we need some Josephs. You see, there's a little something we can learn from Joseph. Joseph experienced some things. You see, he had some brothers. And of course, Joseph and his brothers had the same father, but different mothers. <laughs> Did you catch that? Joseph and his brothers had the same father, but different mothers. Just like us, right? We all worship the same God, but some of us, well, we're kind of, we're on, we're on our own spiritual journey that may not necessarily be in connection with the Father. You see, the 11, Joseph had 11 brothers. The 11 did not like Joseph. Why? Because he kept the commandments of his father and had the gift of prophecy. And of course, he was persecuted for his faith, just like many of us will be persecuted for our faith. So he ends up in Egypt, right? Persecuted, sent to Egypt, the Mecca of false worship of his day. And while he's there, he's tempted, get this, he's tempted by a harlot. And he's thrown into prison. But because he had the spirit of prophecy, he was able to interpret a dream by Pharaoh. What was Pharaoh's dream? Listen to this, my friends. Remember the seven, cat, the seven fat cattle and the seven scrawny, you know, sickly cattle? And it ate up the fat cattle. Same thing with the ears of corn, seven healthy ears of corn. Seven, that represented seven years of famine. What did Joseph tell? He foretold there was a famine coming, but how did he tell the people to prepare for that famine? See, many of us, we need to receive this counsel. We are told that there's a famine coming. You see, Joseph told his people to prepare for the famine during that seven years of plenty to gather grain. Now, what did they do with the grain? They made bread. You see, we need to be gathering bread. If we're going to make it through this coming famine, in fact, Amos chapter 8, verse 11 reminds us of this famine. Behold, the days are coming. Here it is. Says the Lord God that I will send a famine upon the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but a hearing of the word of the Lord. My friends, a famine is coming. And Laodicea ain't ready for it. We got to get our hearts right today, my friends. Jesus is, in, is coming soon. And so I echo the words found in the first volume of the man, or first manuscript from 1890 when Ellen White screamed. I could just hear her screaming in loving agony, God of heaven, wake us up. That should be our prayer today. And my final appeal to you today, my friends, is pray that prayer. God of heaven, wake me up. 
Wake me from my Laodicean slumber. Help me to receive this time in which I'm living to prepare bread and to seek the Lord in his word to prepare my heart for what is coming. That should be our prayer. In fact, let's pray that in closing. Father in heaven, wake us up, Lord. Give us your Holy Spirit. Prepare us for the famine that is coming. That is what we ask in Jesus' holy name.